Okay, so as I said, this is recruitment selection, and it's sorry, it's looking at all the functions of the HR department or the HR functions. Um, sometimes in your assessment, it would refer to it as HR activities, but really what we're talking about is within HR, we can refer to recruitment and selection, training and development, things like that as functions as well. So you'll come across different terminology that might mean the same thing. So here are a list of the different HR activities that we're going to be looking at. Um, as I say, we'll start with recruitment and selection, induction are all part of core activities, learning outcome one. Um, most of these will come back up again in um, core activities. So learning and development is um, one of the learning outcomes in core activities. Employee relations comes into core activities. Um, equality and diversity legislation generally feeds out across everything we're going to be looking at, both in HR introduction and HR core activities. The reward and recognition, so pay and reward is also a learning outcome for core activities. And again, um, evaluation, if you're looking at how well the employees are, are working, how well they're doing their job, if they're effective, um, could they improve? Do they require training? All of those things are wrapped up in um, what we call performance management. So that, again, would be another area of core activities. So as you can see with HR intro, we're introducing the different activities that can occur within HR. But when we come on to do core activities in January, you'll be going into each of these in a bit more detail. So as I say, we're going to start off with recruitment and selection. And what we have in front of us are the key stages that occur within recruitment and selection. And it's quite important to remember all of these um, different areas. The ones in red, um, I don't know if I'm just colourblind, so I'm just going to read them out. So I know my husband would not be able to distinguish between red and green here. Um, the red ones are what we call the recruitment process. So that's why we split them down into two. So recruitment is identifying the vacancy, finding out does a job actually exist, carrying out a job analysis so that we can find out what's involved in actually doing the job and from that produce a job description and a person specification. Once you've got those put together, you can then think about writing the job advert, how you're going to advertise, where you're going to advertise so that you're going to attract people to your organisation, you're going to generate interest in the jobs, um, get applications in and then how you're actually going to manage that process, looking at setting deadlines for submitting job applications, dealing with inquiries, those sorts of things. Then the next three um, stages are part of the selection process. So the, the recruitment is about promoting the job, making sure that the job you're advertising is fit for the company, attracting the application so that people are actually going to apply for the job. But once you've got your applications within the organisation and you're sitting with, traditionally it would have been a pile of papers, now it's always just going to be um, emails in the inbox or um, electronic submissions, but you're going to have a lot of applicants and with some jobs just now, I'm hearing of because so many people have been made redundant or being placed on furlough and there's lots of uncertainty, many people, many more people are looking for jobs. So employers can be sitting with hundreds of applicants for one job. So how do they narrow that down? Because you don't want to interview that many people. So how do you narrow that down? So looking at how you select the candidates, what different methods you use to go through the applications to narrow it down, how do you um, interviews, testing, all these different things. We'll be looking at all of those. That's all part of your selection process. Then making the appointment, actually offering the person the job. And then the final stage of the selection process would actually be the induction itself. So um, with recruitment and selection, we're going to go through all six of these stages in quite a bit of detail. But as I say, the first three are the recruitment process and the, the last three are the selection process. So taking each of those one by one, um, job analysis is the process that we go through now. 
remember there are two phrases as we go through the studies there are two phrases that sound almost identical and what they involve is very very similar as well so job analysis is only used when we're talking about recruitment and selection so another phrase we use called job evaluation which is more to do with pain reward so job analysis you use when we're talking about recruitment and selection so job analysis you're looking at what's involved in the job you're breaking it down into its, its in, individual um, component parts so what does the person actually do minute by minute within their job day by day but minute by minute what are they actually doing how would you define the different roles the different activities who do they talk to who do they interact with how much time do they spend on the different parts of the job how much effort is required how much knowledge is required all of these different things. Um, so as it says here, it can be duties and tasks. It can be the environment. So are they working in a nice, clean, comfortable office? Or are they working in a cold factory? Um, so you're thinking about the environment. You're thinking about, does that have an impact on how they do the job? Is that something that you'd want to tell the candidate about so that they can make the best decision about whether or not they want that job? What tools do they need to do the job? And what equipment's required? <clears throat> that might also be down to the skills that they need, the knowledge that they've got to have. Um, you maybe can't necessarily specify a certain amount of experience because that could be classed as discrimination. But you might want to think about, you know, if you're looking for someone to work in an HR department, do they have to have an HR qualification? Do they have to know how to manage a recruitment process, for example? Do they know how to do the job analysis? Um, so you're looking for particular skills, particular knowledge and experience, but you probably couldn't just say, you know, must have three years experience. But we'll come and look at that when we look at the discrimination stuff. Um, Relationships, are they working as part of a team? Are they working independently? Who do they report to? Do they have anybody reporting to them? Do they work with people in other departments? Are they working with maybe partners outside of the organisation? So for example, for me, and the curriculum manager who's in charge of the CIPD courses, we have a relationship working with the CIPD, working with the local CIPD branch working with various other people within CAPD as well. So um, a job analysis should be trying to establish all of these different things and any requirements. So as I say, that could be things like, you know, must have a formal CAPD qualification, must have CAPD membership. So it will vary depending on the job, but what you're doing in the job analysis is looking at all of that information. Then once you've got all of that information, you're going to create or review your job description your personal specification if it's an existing job just because the job's there already doesn't mean that things don't change you know if you think back to maybe what a job involved five years ago ten years ago it's possibly changed you know there may be small things that have changed or it could be that things have changed massively because of technological advancements for example so you want to look at what the person's actually currently doing in the job and does that actually reflect what's written in the job description. So sometimes it can be looking at the job description and you've got to rewrite it, creating a new job description. Other times it could be actually it's still fairly representative. You don't have to do anything. But obviously, if you're wanting to introduce a new job, you would have to go through this process um, so you can actually identify what's involved with the job. But as I say, job analysis is purely focused on um, recruitment and selection. So the key reasons for doing this is to find out what's involved in the job so that when you advertise a job, your job description, your personal specification are accurate and accurately reflect the job that's actually required so that someone applying for the job knows what they're applying for and knows what to expect when they actually start doing the job. So there are different ways that you can carry out a job analysis and different methods, different people will produce different results. So you perhaps want to use 
more than one of these methods don't rely on just one thing so as it says you might look at the existing job description look at the training manuals to find out what's involved in actually training that person what training do they require to go through again it could be that that's not going to be up to date and looking at the training manual might help you to identify that look at individual records of how the employee is performing um, you know, if one employee is not performing very well, then perhaps that employee's got a problem. But if across the board, all your employees are struggling with a particular area, is that something to do with the training manual or the training that's been delivered? Or is the job description not actually reflecting what's required for the job? And it needs to be looked at. You can interview the person doing the job, get their input in terms of what their, what their take is. You probably want to talk to more than one person because <clears throat> individuals will have their own take on what's involved in their job and a job analysis is about the job. It's not about the person, so it has to define the job so that someone else coming into the job does exactly the same things. But you may have some employees who are happy in their job, are engaged in their job and will therefore um, deliver what we call discretionary behaviour or discretionary effort, which means that they will go above and beyond what's required. They'll do more than just their job. So, you know, you think about a term we attach usually to people who work in the council as having a jobs worth mentality. <clears throat> this is what my job description says. That's not on my job description, so I'm not doing it. <clears throat> the risk is that if you're doing interviews with job holders, and they do more than more than what's on their job description. They may see that as part of their job, but that's a standard above and beyond what you're looking for. So you have to make sure that the job description reflects the job itself and not what one individual's made of that job. So that's why you would interview more than one person so that you get the different perspectives. Talk to their manager find out what the manager thinks should be involved in the job what they expect the employee to be doing again it will also allow you to identify if there's any discrepancy between what the manager thinks and what the employee thinks um, sometimes the employee might be doing things that the manager's not aware of as well because they are doing different jobs so getting the input and the feedback from both of them is quite important equally you can actually just watch the employee take notes of what they're doing um, so that you can actually see what they do when they're doing the job rather than just relying on what they're telling you. Um, one risk of observation is, generally speaking, if you know you're being observed, you may change your behaviours. So you may do things differently than how you would normally do them. Um, so again, that's a reason why you would use more than one method. So you're getting ideas and input from different areas. Another one that's not listed here might be something like getting the employee to keep a log and a diary of what they're doing. So, so they're actually recording what they do as they're going along. Um, interviewing someone, if they have a job that's really, really repetitive, it might be easy to remember what they do. But if they've got a job where they're doing different things all the time and it varies a lot, it may be difficult to remember everything. But Again, that could be a problem with any of these aspects because if you observe someone doing their job and the job's really varied and there's things they maybe only do once or twice a year, unless you observe them at that point, you're not going to see that. Um, equally, they may forget about it or if they're keeping a diary, unless it's something repetitive, the diary may not capture everything they're doing as well. With something like this, it would be better to give the employee um, time to think about what they're doing. So, you know, rather than an interview, you could ask them to give you a note of what they do um, or give them time to write up what they think they do and then maybe have an interview afterwards so that you've got the chance to talk over and you know if they have forgotten anything then that, that can be captured then as well. So these are just some of the ideas but um, there's lots of different ways as it said as you can imagine to gather the information and Effectively, it's a form of research. It's a form of what we call primary research because you're gathering the information for yourself for the first time. Okay, so moving on to our next slide. Looking at the job description itself. 
So the job description, as it says in the slide, describes a job, but actually tells us what's involved in doing the job. So like I was saying with the job analysis, this is not focused on the person, this is focused on the job itself. Um, and generally speaking, job descriptions will contain the job title, department you're working in, your pay grade, your main location. So um, my my job description or my contract says that I'm based in um, Aloha, but our job description will probably say something like, you know, you're likely to be working across all three campuses. Um, <clears throat> it will tell you who you report to, if you have any staff reporting to you, may have a copy of the organisational chart or make reference to it. Um, we'll have a brief summary of why the job exists, what's the purpose of the job and we'll then carry out or have a list of um, key duties. So what are the key requirements of you doing that job or what are the um, key, key tasks that you're going to be carrying out as part of your job? And if there's anything else, so as it says here, you know, are you required to, sh to work shifts? Are you required to work across different, for me, different campuses, different locations, different sites? Um, do you need to be mobile? Do you need to have access to a car? Do you need a driving license? Those sorts of things may, may all be part of your job description. Then listing it separately, although in reality, a lot of companies combine the job description, the person specification, and may call it something like role profile or something like that. But <clears throat> they are very distinct. So the job description describes the job, tells us about the duties, what's actually required to do the job. The person specification will tell us about the person that you're looking for. <clears throat> so it will tell you about the qualifications that you require. It will tell you about any specific experience. It will tell you about the skills that you need, the knowledge, any personal characteristics. So um, if you're looking for someone in sales, you don't want someone that's really, really shy and don't, doesn't talk to anybody. You want somebody that's outgoing, that um, perhaps has some drive that can push sales through. So thinking about the characteristics that are perhaps important for a particular job. <clears throat> and as it says, the person specification again is going to be drawing from the job analysis, but it's also going to draw on what you've put into the job description. So if you need someone that um, is working in HR at managerial level, you may require that they have CAPD membership at a, a chartered level, for example. So you will have your key requirements. And what you will also have is with a person specification is broken down into what we call essential criteria and desirable criteria. So, for example, if we stick with the idea of an HR manager, essential might be to have a postgraduate level qualification in HR to be a CAPD member. So that might be the essential might be that if you have that or you're working towards it. Um, <clears throat> And the desirable might be that you're a charter fellow of the CIPD, which shows that you've got more experience and you're already working at that level. So it could be <clears throat> essential for, say, uh, someone to work in a marketing team. The essential might be to have an HNC in business. But the desirable could be that that's got to be an HND or it's got to be a degree. So the essential is the minimum criteria that you want everybody to meet. And these are really, really important as well, because when it comes to selecting someone for the job, you're looking at your essential criteria. And if someone does not meet that, they're automatically excluded because they've not met your minimum. So the essential criteria should be a minimum of what you're looking for. Don't make it a wish list that's making it too difficult for everybody to match. What you're then doing is you're saying, right, if people meet our essential criteria and we still have a lot of applicants, which you hope that they're not going to apply if they don't meet the minimum criteria, 
But if they meet the minimum criteria and you still have too many, then you're going to have to go back through your applicants again. And you'll then use desirable criteria to see who, who has the desirables and then try to narrow it down from there to decide who are the best candidates for you, for your organisation, for the job, and then interview those or whatever other methods that you're using to select your candidates. So the, the job description and the person specification are really important to allow the company to go from the recruitment process to the selection process because the selection process should be based on how well they match the requirements that you've set out for the job. So again, you can see why it's quite important to get these things right to start with. <clears throat> So now we have a little diagram showing you what it might look like in practice. But to be honest, look at any job advert. You'll come across these documents in, in any job advert and you'll see what they look like. But you can see here we have, obviously we're just using generic terms, but knowledge could be the qualifications you've got. Um, it could be knowing how to do something. So if you're looking for a receptionist, the knowledge could be that they know how to operate a particular type of switchboard. Um, skills could be IT skills, could be that they're used to working on the telephone. Experience, as I say, try to be as specific as possible with that, you know, has experience of working with a particular type of system, has experience of working with Microsoft Teams, for example. Personal qualities, outgoing, friendly, <clears throat> has good attention to detail, whatever it might be that's important for that job. And then you're, you're listing what are essential and what are desirable. For some, you'll have essential with everything. And then maybe some things that you say, you know, this is a requirement and there's no desirable, it is just essential. Don't feel that you have to put desirable criteria in under every heading, but um, it does help the company to differentiate between candidates if they have desirables listed as well as essentials. Okay, so thinking now about you've got your job descriptions, you've got your person specification, you then want to think about how you're going to attract candidates. And we have a list of um, <clears throat> different systems that we can use job centres, recruitment agencies, executive search organisations, um, they would really be called headhunters. So a recruitment agency, you, I'm assuming everybody knows what a recruitment agency is. You go along, you say, I'm looking for a job, look for this type of job, and they put you on their books and companies contact them and say, right, okay, I'm advertising this job. They look to see what candidates they have and match the two together. An executive search organisation or a headhunter, as I said, would be where a company, usually when they're looking for something senior, so for example, if the college was to look for a new principal, rather than advertising or contacting an agency saying, right, we've got this principal's job, we want you to, to fill it, they might contact an executive search organisation who will then think about the job, think about other people that they know of in the same field, so maybe other principals or people who are senior within colleges or within schools or universities and who they think might be good candidates and they will try to encourage them to consider the job. So these are not necessarily going to be people that are um, looking for jobs but they will contact people that they think will be good candidates and try to encourage them to consider the job. So it tends to be at a really, really high level. We can try advertising in national newspapers, local newspapers. Again, where you advertise will vary depending on the level of the job. If you're looking for a senior manager, you will advertise in the national newspapers because you're going to... Um, have your advert distributed to a much wider audience. But if you're looking for a receptionist, you may only advertise locally because it's easier to fill that job. Um, and the salary is a lot lower as well. So people are less likely to travel a distance or to move from one area to another area for a job unless it's highly paid. Specialist and professional journals. So, you know, if you're looking for 
an accountant, you might advertise in the accountancy professional journals. Um, if you're if you're advertising within the construction sector, you might advertise within the construction sector literature. Um, retail, I believe, have their own magazines as well. So most sectors will have their own specialist magazines as well that they can advertise in. Um, obviously, the internet is much more common now as well. Um, I think it's how most most jobs are advertised. So you've got you know companies' websites, so you can register an interest directly with the companies. But you also have online agencies as well that you can register with. Um, the same as you would go into a recruitment agency in the high street, for example, you can log on to their sites online and and register with them that way. What it means by newer web 2.0 approaches is things like your Facebook, LinkedIn. So these are now, you know, they're commonplace. It's what we use all the time. So using social media to advertise your job, to promote yourself. And obviously, if a company has a Facebook following or a Twitter following or whatever, then they've already got a lot of loyalty attached to the brand from the people that are following them. So advertising to that audience should be easier to attract candidates because they're already interested in the organisation and therefore are more likely to respond positively when they advertise and, and look for jobs. Local schools and colleges or with universities advertising your jobs. So if you're looking for a job, you know, look, looking for a vacancy to be filled, you can contact <clears throat> the departments within within the colleges or the schools or <clears throat> you can go out and do visits and promote yourself saying that you know you recruit and here's what you do or what universities do um is have milk rounds so they have the companies come in and talk to all the the students who are likely to be graduating at the end of the year and they will do mass interviews to maybe recruit for their graduate training programs for example but you've also got careers fairs and things like that that um, you would normally see within the education sector as well so there's lots of opportunities for companies to promote themselves that way as well and in word of mouth just talking to everybody individually <clears throat> I'm going to keep going with the presentation rather than get you to think about the advantages and disadvantages of each of these at the moment but it is perhaps something that you can think about later on your own <clears throat> so <clears throat> before you actually place your advert you know as well as thinking about where you're going to advertise <clears throat> and thinking about the advantages and disadvantages of all of the different methods you need to think about how you're going to get the candidates to apply you know, are they going to apply online? Do you want them to send an email with their CV? Do you want them to fill in an application form? Are you going to get things sent by post? Um, do you have copies of the application form that can be sent out, whether it's by post or by email? Or is it an online process that they have to actually log on to a website, fill everything in online? So you have to think about these sorts of things. Um, uh, as it says here, the application forms and the CVs are both different and they have different strengths um, and weaknesses. And some companies will actually get you to do both. But obviously, as it says, the next slide is going to give us some ideas of things to think about. Applications tend to give us all the information in a, a common format. The applications laid out in a way so that the companies can easily find information. They know where to look for the information they're looking for. Um, but CVs can be more difficult to sift because they're more personal, they're more unique. Um, and it's it well but it is also an opportunity for the the candidates to show their individuality but sometimes if it's too different and too difficult to find the information and the manager's particularly busy they may not have the time or the inclination to start searching through lots and lots of cvs to, to look for information 
Um, but as I said, they're, they're quite common with managerial roles, more senior roles, um, and that's to allow some creativity and to see the personality of the individuals a little bit. But you know that um, with an application form, you're setting the questions, you're, you're controlling the direction of the information within the application form. So it's much easier for you to find whether or not the information you're looking for is there. And online systems sometimes where it's all completely online, um, the systems need to be set up carefully to make sure that the keywords that you're looking for are as wide as possible. So that, you know, sometimes you can get a really good applicant who hasn't used a particular keyword, for example, and therefore their application gets rejected. And it's been one of the criticisms of online sifting. So again, thinking about how companies can get around that. So <clears throat> the key things to think about when you're creating your advert, you obviously want your advert to be eye-catching. It's got to attract the attention. Um, but how how you do that and what that might look like, whether what you create is eye-catching for the right reasons, you want to make sure that it's going to come across. You know, if you're a professional company, you want it to come across as professional. If your company is trying to be fun and dynamic, then you might want to reflect that in your, ad, in your advert as well. But if you're trying to be professional and serious and your advert is flippant, um, it could go against you and it could cause problems. So make sure that it's going to attract attention. It's going to stand out. But at the same time, it's like a lot of different things. We have an expectation of what information we're going to find in a job advert, what the format's going to look like, how much information we expect to see there. And if we don't get that, just like... I said a, a, a manager, a, recruit, a recruitment manager may not be willing to sit and go through all the application forms if they've got to sit through lots of CVs trying to find information. If you're looking for a job and you don't like the look of their advert or you can't find the information you're looking for, you may not bother with that company. So they have to make sure that not only do they attract your attention, but they retain it. And you've got to make sure that you're not discriminating um, so you've got to make sure that you're not um, specifying age, gender, race. Make sure that the criteria doesn't um, exclude people. And we'll go over that in a bit more detail later on. But we're trying to make sure that um, with the job advert that you're complying with the Equalities Act 2010. So again, some of this is probably a bit more specific, um, building on what I've already said, but if your company is well known, you know, if you're advertising Microsoft, make sure you use the company's logo so that people recognize it instantly. And, you know, if, if you're working for Google or someone like that, the minute you put the logo on the advert, that in itself is going to attract attention even without doing anything else. Make sure the job title is really, really clear, really easy to see so people can see at a glance, is this the type, you know, yes, I see it's Google, but they're looking for a cleaner. I may want to work for Google, but I'm perhaps not wanting to be a cleaner. I'm, I'm a technical analyst or something like that. So you want to be able to see when you look at the job advert, yes, that's that's a suitable job for me. Yes, I'm going to be interested in that. Keep the text short and simple, but make sure that you're covering the key things about the job so there's enough information for someone to make a decision about is this going to be appropriate, is this something I'm still interested in or not. So it allows them to deselect themselves if they're not going to meet the criteria, but you have to give them enough information to allow them to do that. But at the same time, try to make sure you're not overloading them with information. Avoid generalizations like attractively sal attractive salary or suitably qualified. It says here it may be off-putting, yes, if but it's also subjective. What I think of as an attractive salary may not be the same as what you consider to be attractive. So it's very subjective and it will be based on perhaps if you're already in a job. 
whether it's attractive enough to make you want to leave. So when you're writing job adverts, it's better to try and be as specific as possible. So rather than an attractive salary, give a salary range or tell them what the salary is. Make sure that they know how to apply and what the closing date is. And if you're using more than one place to advertise your job, so company website, online website, um, and in a newspaper, make sure that it's consistent, make sure that the advert looks the same across all of the different sources. Um, and as it says, make sure it's legally compliant in terms of the language, the content, and that the information is accessible. Okay, so if they need an application form in large print, make sure that's available. Um, so just make sure it's dynamic and make sure that the website's not discriminatory as well. You know, sometimes people can have um, sight problems or reading text if the colour of the background's not compatible. So thinking about those things or make sure that people have the option to change things if they need to as well. <clears throat> right, I think I'm going to stop there just now because that's us covered the recruitment methods and we'll come back and look at the selection methods afterwards.